Book of Hours is determined to remain an essential platform that offers a creative interpretation for lockdown skeptics and experts who have been censored by mainstream press. Thanks to your donations, we can carry on doing this essential work as working artists. These big issues of the day are vital and need to be heard. So please share our videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel, make a one-time donation on our PayPal page, but most importantly, please be a part of our team on our Patreon page. Go to patreon.com slash book of hours and hit the blue button titled become a patron. Thank you. If you've been following our new model series up till now, you have probably guessed that life as we know it will change in very radical ways. As we produce this video, it's the summer of 2020, and a lot of people will need to make some big decisions that will affect their lives and their children's lives now and in the future. So before we get into the details of what's to come in the areas of education and employment, we're going to cut to the chase and give it to you straight. Every parent wants their child to have a better life than the one they had. Every parent wants their child to grow up to be successful, to be of use, and to feel fulfilled in their work. The new model we'll explore in this video isn't just an innovation in school technology. This new model robs children of their childhood. Recess is canceled. Field trips are canceled. Sitting with friends at lunch is canceled. Play is canceled. In this new model, before a child is born, the systems we are talking about decide whether she is viable or not viable. This is nothing more than a pre-crime prison sentence based on what investments will see the best return. A child in this new model is taught how to code the future digital landscape and how to behave in society. Right now, children are being introduced to a new model of school learning which will never help them get ahead in life. This new model will only lead them to a life of debt and servitude. In the early stages of life, the way a child is perceived or how he behaves now will shape his future and how he lives for the rest of his life. Right now, children are being taught how to build their brand. Right now, children are being shaped into slaves and they are being taught that it's better to be enslaved than it is to be free. This is an abomination against humanity. This is lifelong learning. This is the fourth industrial revolution. What's happening is that all curriculum in public, private, parochial, charter, and even homeschools is going to be behavioral driven. Collection of children's data into a blockchain where the child is put on a pathway of viable or not viable is based on the economic status he was born into. Children as young as three years are being treated as corporate reports. Ultimately, the children are digital creators and builders of an internet of things. The masking and physical distance and the taking away of play, recess, field trips, helps to train them early on that human interaction and exploration of imagination gets in the way of their pathway. The merit system is no longer about a sliding scale grading system as we've always known, but more about electronic badges for how well they follow directions or how well they behave. Their future is punitive rather than edifying, and their education is more of an imprisonment than a place to learn and grow. All of this will have profound psychological effects on the child. We imagine during the first few phases of this new type of pathway learning, 
we will see collateral damage in the family. What must it do to a child's anxiety to have a temperature gun pointed at his head multiple times a day by someone who is faceless and looks like a non-human? These types of tactics are meant to prepare a child for the digital future that he may need to manage and it indoctrinates him into normalizing touchless and humanless interaction. This may seem like a science fiction novel, but it's already been rolled out, and parents need to understand. It is their choice to keep their children into this system or remove them altogether and create new autonomous learning zones that operate outside of it all. This may prove challenging, but it is necessary. Let's continue to explore the definition of lifelong learning. If we want to know how we will all be treated in the future, we need to look at how the impoverished have been treated in the past. So we need to first ask ourselves, what is the cost of social support programs like special education or treating depression or other social policies? The idea of cost for these things is never really thought about by ordinary people. A lot of us have health insurance, or we rely on government programs or institutions like schools or after-school programs to cover those things. And the cost? That cost normally comes out of our taxes. That's of course the concept that all of us still hold in our minds. It's a 20th century way of thinking. With that in mind, think about how over the last 40 years or so, politicians have been pushing the idea of cutting taxes, cutting back on government and government services. Of course, they've been telling us that we, the taxpayers, are demanding tax cuts. But all the while, it's the politicians who are creating fictitious scapegoats like welfare mothers who are having too many babies or deadbeat dads who don't pay child support. In other words, we've been manipulated into thinking that our tax dollars are being wasted on poor people who don't want to work and that we're paying too many taxes, while at the same time ignoring the fact that our tax money goes to support corporations, the military, and the top end of the government. And while poor people on welfare were vilified by the media and politicians, the reality is that these same politicians, or the ones before them, created these very systems to steer poor people into the systematic and generational cycles of institutional racism, poverty, welfare, unemployment, prisons, and incentives to have all those babies that keep them scapegoated. But ultimately, within that cyclical system. In other words, financialization of the poor has been around for a long time, at least since Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. With the coming of the 90s, the vilification of the poor reached a high point that would set our society on the course that is culminating in front of our eyes right now. It was back then that we saw the beginning of government performance-based contracting. The concept of ending welfare as we know it, as well as reinventing government. And all of this was done on the backs of the impoverished. But at the same time, began the process of the dissolution of the middle class. Since then, a lot has happened in the world of finance, education, and social services. School and how kids learn is nothing like what their parents or grandparents experienced. The job market has changed radically since the 90s and is going to become even more unrecognizable. And whether you know it or not, we are all now seeing all of these economic sectors coming together, brought about through disruptive innovations like social impact bonds, social investing, and human capital management. 
The COVID scare has allowed these systems to be set into motion to disrupt our lives and change the way we live now and in the future. The financialization of the poor in the past is only the blueprint for what's to come for all of us in the future. And that future will be what was done before only on steroids. And who's going to be enslaved to build that future? The children. The education system that is about to be implemented has been in the works for the past 25 to 30 years. Over this period of time, education has transformed into training, creativity into compliance, serendipity into standards, and human connection into digital isolation. As the curriculum narrowed in its scope, emphasizing standardized test scores and demonstrations of skill, education became a hollowed out exercise, something that could be digitized and outsourced to corporations. All of the things we associate with being a child have been taken away. Learning through play, negotiating relationships on the playground, and learning how to behave in public are no longer what children will learn. We saw evidence of this at the beginning of the pandemic, when the playgrounds were the first things to be closed and locked up. The devices currently found in our children's classrooms are largely there because a specific set of government policies have prioritized technology over human educators for the past 15 years. These devices are watching us as much as we are watching them, and we should be aware that many of the programs in use are a direct outgrowth of the work done by the Department of Defense in partnership with private sector interests and institutions of higher education. The system and policies that brought about these shifts in how children are educated were put into place by the Department of Defense and three different U.S. presidents, starting with Clinton and ending with Obama. These policies from the very beginning were designed to transition education from human teachers in school buildings to an environment of anytime, anyplace learning using technology to keep track of a student's progress and behavior and eventually create a reality of personal data tracking and lifelong learning. This is why we are now faced with the impossibly difficult choice forced on us to either put our children into deplorable conditions in the classrooms with face masks, social distancing, and staying in one room all day without recess, or forcing children into a learning ecosystem of online learning, building their brand, collecting badges, and building skills, digital slavery, behavior profiling, and learning how to become a corporate report before the age of five. Here is the big picture. The future is going to run on behavioral blockchain currency. Everyone will be tracked, monitored, and recorded into a blockchain ledger. Through artificial intelligence software, our interests, our behaviors, what we eat, how much we eat, where we go, what we like, where we live, what we do for work or not do for work, Everybody's lives will be recorded and used for predictive behavior modeling that will be used for social credit scoring and prescribed behavior management. We will all be put onto a life pathway that serves the investments of the wealthy who are making money from our lives. We will become human capital and we will be the batteries of the future economy. And if, by some chance, we escape that future, or even some of it, our children will not. The new model of lifelong learning is feeding our children into an economy run by billionaires. From what we are seeing, education and employment will be interchangeable. 
through 12 will exist in name only, if at all, and the system used to track your child's progress as they are trained will be about collecting badges, indicating the skills they've acquired at a certain time and place. 21st century education will be children getting a playlist education, where based on the child's past, performance algorithms will serve up the next lesson she needs to know next. Gamified experiences and online simulations developed through Advanced Distribution Learning and DARPA, an agency of the United States Department of Defense, in partnership with many universities and nonprofits, will also provide a structure to capture students' soft skills and shape their behavior. Depending on the status your child is born into, their life pathway will determine the kind of work and the kind of behavior required of them for their entire life. There will be no social advancement. Unless people fall out of the system or are demoted for bad behavior or just not showing up for any reason, they will stay in their place doing what is prescribed for them through pay for success contracts and social impact bonds that determine the kind of work they will do. And it doesn't matter if a kid's education is public or Catholic school or homeschooled or private school, all children will be trained to build their education portfolio with skills and badges through experiences and learning everywhere. The only difference is that the private education will guide those children into the managerial class. The people who will be creating and directing the programs that the other children will later, as adults, find themselves funneled into. Institutions like libraries, museums, zoos, aquariums, and learning centers, which were once just fun places to visit with friends and family, will now be experiences that create opportunities to earn a badge. This fun trip to the zoo is now a cataloged data badge to add to the child's learning record store. These outings, which we've all had our entire lives, which are supposed to be relaxing and fun, will now be an excuse to monitor and track behavioral data which will be held into the Learning Record Store, or LRS. LRSs also store information about what video you watched, what online quizzes you took, and what the results of those quizzes were, what websites you visited, what books you purchased, what games you played, what articles you read or annotated, and on and on it goes. During these interactions, you can bet the child's data is captured through sensors or RFID chips and even biometric monitors. And if a child is not taught within this controlled system, they will be essentially off the grid with no opportunities or path for employment, social services, or even acknowledgement of their very existence. From cradle to grave, lifelong learning will be part of everyone's lives, with everyone having to learn new skills to keep up with their employment opportunities or ever-changing work requirements. But the part that's even more important, the one that determines how a child grows up and what kind of employment track they have, will depend on their behavior. All of us, from young to old, will constantly have our social and health behavior tracked and recorded into the blockchain record. But to what end? Why would the billionaires running the world care how an ordinary person behaves? The reason is because your behavior is seen as a prediction of what kind of person you are. Will you work hard and stay with the program? Or will you go to prison? Do you eat healthy food and get enough sleep? Or do you drink excessively, take drugs, or act out in public? These behaviors determine the kinds of programs that are created and invested in. All of these behaviors from childhood through adulthood are used to predict what kind of citizen you will be 
and what kinds of programs you're channeled into. Controlled and monitored behavior is rewarded with better work opportunities and living options. Free or independent behavior is punished through the denial of services such as SNAP benefits for food or for housing. The work itself will never really amount to much. Most, if not all of us, will be in the gig economy, in which work will be a series of gigs that we most likely will bid on or apply for, sometimes competing against other workers for that gig or taking whatever comes along. And these will all be controlled on a digital platform that will track the jobs we bid on, apply for, take, turn down, and how much we make, but most importantly, the rating we receive for each job. What this race to the bottom competition does is wear down a person's self-worth, especially children. The negative emotional impact this has on an individual's response to negative reviews, despite having worked hardest at their project, will eventually take its toll psychologically. Remember, a child's pathway and destiny is already laid out for him when he's in the womb. If he's born into privilege with two dedicated working parents, his pathway for life will be easy, and whether he works hard or not, his project reviews will be good. If the child in the womb is born to a single mother with dysfunction and no real stable home life, this will set the pace for his life. Even if he works the hardest on his project, he will never get the top review. This, of course, has nothing whatsoever to do with how a child really is. This type of existence and lifelong learning pathway actually makes dysfunctional children who grow up to be dysfunctional adults. But what if people don't make enough money from these gigs and what then? Well, that's what the third sector is for. What is the third sector? These are the nonprofits like the United Way that create programs that augment or replace social services from the government. In other words, they, along with other organizations like philanthropic foundations and corporations, make up public private partnerships. Public private partnerships provide the outsourced services that the government can't provide or no longer provides. These partnerships provide wraparound services that help the poor. They are the programs that are invested in. Third sector organizations are paid by investors as service providers through social impact investments that are designed to meet a need that will offset the future cost of a negative impact like incarceration or food insecurity with a positive impact. Oftentimes these investments known as social impact bonds are set up to solve a problem that doesn't yet exist. The bonds have rules, expectations, and measurable outcomes built into them so that the investors know when the metrics are met. Like X number of people served or a given number of items or services are provided. It's really about making a profit from a manufactured so-called need. No one will have the kind of a life pathway with a secure future because there is no incentive for social bond investors to allow people to get out of the system. Investments in social programs to help people are created to keep people in need of the wraparound services they use in order to close the gaps between gigs like food, energy, heating, and housing. The investors get paid to close gaps in a person's life. If the gap is only partially closed, the investor still gets paid. But keeping that gap open allows for further investment opportunities. So keeping someone in a gig economy with unsteady income allows for the continued opportunity to provide more social impact investments and more programs that are paid for by those investments. 
if it's profitable to invest in poverty, then there is an incentive to create more poverty in order to grow the market. These social impact investments, which pay for wraparound services provided by nonprofits, exist for one purpose to justify the pay of people who run them. They can only exist as long as a child remains poor and in the class he was born into. Children are used to keep the nonprofits running and rarely, if ever, see the benefit or enrichment to their own lives. The result of social impact investment into social services with third sector service providers via public private partnerships is that people who use these services as a result of the life pathway they were channeled into from birth now become human capital. Human capital quantifies people as data and values people for their perceived contribution to an economy. But it has to start somewhere, and it will all start with children who are born now and in school today. Children are the new human capital that will build out the economy of the future. Since the children are the new capital, the current educational programs are all about managing children, not educating or edifying them. Masking children, forcing the child to separate from his peers, limiting his play, is how you manage a society of slaves that you want to use to build an effective and efficient future. This year, 2020, children will no longer learn things in school like previous generations have. Instead, they will be trained to code the future digital landscape and how to behave in society. Each child will be managed on a blockchain ledger with no room for individuality and no room for independent thinking. They will build their brand through badges that will show what they've accomplished and how they may be useful to the system. They will build the world that will keep us all under the control of systems administered by the managerial class for the ruling class billionaires. Currently, in some cases and most definitely in the future, a child's pathway may be determined before they are born. As we discussed with predictive modeling around behavior, a person's economic background will determine their future as well. Depending on the socioeconomic status of their parents and even a parent's behavioral record, a child's destiny, where they will be placed in the hierarchy of the system, what they do for work, how they will be taught and cared for, may all be decided while they are still in the womb. This means that a child born to an impoverished single mother in which the father is not around much will have less opportunity in the type of education or future employment than a child born to a two-parent middle-class family. In both cases, the child will be fed into an economy run by the ruling class with the only difference being the level of education they receive and their status as a gig worker, a manager, or a director. This, of course, isn't much different from what goes on today. The main difference is that in the future, all children will be placed and tracked through a system that will use their personal data for a behavioral futures market aimed at tech workers or social impact and hedge fund investments focused on programs that impose a half loaves service that never truly meets a person's needs. There are currently home visit programs in which nurses visit mothers who just gave birth and are a means to begin the process of profiling children. These programs are tied to pay for success contracts linked to social impact bonds. An app that collects data and behavior is used to place the mother and the baby into the system. These programs are not voluntary and are tied to the eligibility for benefits like SNAP for food or housing vouchers. 
Investing in kids as human capital markets and hedge fund markets requires constant movement or data hooking people into Internet of Things, sensors and devices, recalibrating a person's value and worth in real time. Wraparound services that augment existing programs for things like work training or glasses for kids are provided by third sector organizations in conjunction with the school education center the child attends. These third sector nonprofits reach out to parents for permission to collect a student's personal data by couching it in terms of providing better services to a child. This data is used to provide standardizations and rules for hedge fund investments. So schools will be one of the more important nodes for data extraction from children to put them on whatever life pathway is determined through surveillance in the classroom or through the various devices the children use while learning at home. Children as young as preschoolers are being tracked and surveilled through tabletop devices they play and learn on to determine their behavior for future programs to create and invest in. These programs often have the aim of preemptively fixing someone before they do something that has a negative impact on the community or themselves. If you can profile them into that potentiality of, say, having depression, you can preemptively fix them from something that may never have happened in the first place, with the added bonus of generating a cost offset. As an example, let's say your two-year-old is playing on a tabletop device, which is insisting he choose the color green as an answer. But he keeps choosing the color blue because he prefers it and just wants it. This interaction may cause him to react in frustration. Having the color blue taken away from him might cause him to cry out or get angry, which is a natural reaction for toddlers when the thing they like is taken away. This outburst as a toddler will then flag him as someone with potential behavioral problems, which will trigger the system to direct him into a predetermined life pathway intended to fix him, but will most likely be devastating for his future. This is immoral. The implication of directing a person's life path as they grow into adulthood based on perceived negative behavior as a toddler is aberrant. This is the system that is being put into place today. All aspects of the child's self that is unique and human from an early age will in time be trained out of him. This is why these practices and programs are a moral abomination and need to be called out. People should not be punished as adults for the way they behaved as children. Children are not impact investment commodities. They're not data commodities. They're children. We should be protecting all children from these programs, but there isn't any incentive to protect them by the institutions that should be protecting them. Instead, they're pushing children into these programs to get them started into human capital markets. Parents, whether they are poor or middle class, are completely in the dark about all of this. The teachers who now view their classrooms as clinical settings are accessories to these crimes that will be perpetrated against children. And the reason all this is happening? The billionaires have to keep their capital in circulation. Fifteen years ago, it was toxic mortgages. Now, it's human capital bonds. With such concentrated wealth at the top, the billionaires will only accrue more wealth and power. If they stop, the whole thing falls apart. So they keep going, and it becomes even more brutal.
a lot of what's happening now is connected to debt, not surprisingly, and student debt. The Lumina Foundation is connected to this, um, which is based in Indianapolis, is a, a debt um, company. They're very much involved in the push for competency-based education. Um, this debt will start to manifest in new forms, and, I, and one of these new forms is called the Income Sharing Agreement, or an ISA, and there's a model in um, Purdue, it's called Back a Boiler, where you have someone invest in your education and you agree to share a portion of your income with this person, like over time. But only certain types of um, degrees are attractive and get certain amounts of, there are deals, there are contract deals set up. Um, and this will likely happen through blockchain, these blockchain ledgers. And so there's an organization called Institute for the Future, um, which has a series of little videos. One of them is called Learning is Earning, which talks about learning on blockchain. And then there's a, an other videos that talk about income sharing agreements. They're very short clips. But in the, in the income sharing agreement, when it was a young woman who was debating getting a virtual reality um, degree or a degree in Chinese, because um, you know, one, she could self-finance and one, she had to take an income sharing agreement with, but one paid better. And she was, she was like debating in this video, which she should do. Since its very inception, capitalism has relied on the exploitation of people and built itself and its power in the world through slavery. And the only reason the slave trade went away when it did is because the provenance and tracking of chattel could not be tracked or guaranteed through the systems in place at the time accurately or thoroughly enough for the investors and underwriters of human capital to know what they were getting as a return on their investment. And for a time, they had to replace the unpaid labor of slavery with wage slavery, forcing people to adhere to the industrial program of the clock and the machine. In the factories, offices, and classrooms, people exchanged their time and labor for pay, and it went on long enough for people to think that this is the way it had always been and will always be. With the advent of digital tracking through blockchain ledger technology and artificial intelligence, every person, everything a person does, every health issue, every transaction, every transgression, and everything else in the world, from livestock to moving parts on a machine to an individual blade of grass, can be tracked and traced on the ledger. With this ability to accurately inventory everything and every person in the world, the ruling class, who reluctantly let go of slavery because the ROI wasn't accurate enough to continue the practice, now have the tools and the means to bring it back. But today, they have machines and software that can do the heavy lifting and all the things that human slavery was used for. From working in the fields and factories to the studios, clinics, and classrooms, robots can do what people did before. However, before people can be completely replaced by the technology, the infrastructure needs to be built. People need to teach the machines how to keep track of us while we write the code to build the foundation. But not all of us will be writing this code. After all, adults will want to be paid for their work, and so a new economy and a new kind of worker will be required to build the infrastructure of tomorrow. Those new workers, the coders of tomorrow, are the children of today. This is why schools, the way children learn, and what they learn is changing. And it's changing abruptly because everything in the background has been put into place. They are ready to train the workers of tomorrow. So everything that we have talked about earlier, all the tracking and tracing, the social impact investing, is all connected to what we're seeing today. The classrooms with social isolation and masking 
along with the push to have children work on devices that take the place of the types of learning we, the adults, had in school. The programs being put into place are designed to train the children to be the digital slaves of the near future. They are training now to build the infrastructure of tomorrow. This is why everything is being labeled the new normal. Despite the need for an infrastructure that will run the world of the future, the question of what to do with all of the excess people has been answered with a program of propaganda and lies about politics, health, and the economy. There is certainly an intentional strategy being implemented to reduce the world population because we're no longer needed to run things. Some of us are still needed to care for the kids and run the things that have not yet been replaced by the robots. In the meantime, we must be controlled so the plan will be implemented. This is the reason for the masking, the social distancing, the arbitrary rules for social interaction, business closures, and restricting movement. We are being trained to be obedient slaves as well. The transition is taking place now. That's why small businesses like barbershops and bars need to close or be heavily restricted. Self-employment, the kind that cannot be tracked on a ledger, is messy and human and will not be tolerated. Artificial intelligence and robots will be able to do everything people currently do today, including teaching, medicine, and creative work. But before the world can be run by robots with a few humans around to oversee and manage things, we will be invested in as human capital. The data harvested from us will turn us into the batteries that run the future economy of debt finance, social impact investment, and performance-based contracting. The billionaire ruling class want humans put on social impact pathways, and we will be expected to manage our health via the Internet of Things, wearable devices, and implantable nanotech. So despite what people are saying, it's not the communists that are trying to take over our lives, and this isn't a socialist coup. What is happening is purely capitalist and fascist in nature, and it's all about domination and control. Right now, it doesn't look like there is a way around the educational system that feeds our children into digital slavery. Whether they are taught in a combination of at-home learning and drop-in centers, in classrooms or homeschooled, the kids will all need to have their badges in place in order to exist in the world. Those who are unschooled, without badges, will not be part of the system and will need to have alternative economies and infrastructure in place to live. For us and those children who will inevitably fall out of the system, the future looks very grim if you plan to not be part of that system. How we get around what's to come is still very unclear. No one knows what to do. How do we step off and when? Do you currently know your neighbors? Our lives have been so disconnected by the damage capitalism has done that we live, work, and play without relating or knowing the people we live around. It may be time to start talking to your neighbors and figure out how you and they can work together now and in the future. This may require us to give up the idea of mixing only with people we share an affinity or political view with. There is no need to believe we should be controlled or governed. We can self-govern and manage our own lives and communities without rulers telling us how and where to live, what to do, and what makes us happy. But rather than thinking about creating a situation of mutual productivity and self-sufficiency, we can probably accomplish much more by developing relationships based on reciprocity, gratitude, 
generosity and abundance. Reciprocity and bounty is incompatible with the exploitation of nature and people and it's what will allow us to turn our backs on the slavery that the billionaires have planned for us. Reciprocity and generosity erodes the scarcity and alienation of capitalism. If you have a garden, you have the gift of abundance. If you have skills to create art or useful tools or objects, you have the means to share and exchange with each other in an economy of gratitude rather than one of buying and selling. Buying and selling as a means of exchange creates scarcity and greed, which is at the very heart of capitalism and especially the type of capitalism that is attacking us right now. With that in mind, we have to decide. Are we going to just go along with a system that will enslave us and our children for the rest of our lives? Or do we step away from this nightmare? None of us really have the answer as to how we're going to respond to this and where we'll be in six months, let alone five years. We'll all have to figure out what works for us and for the people around us. In all cases, though, we'll need to renew our human spirit in the face of destruction. It may seem simplistic or idealistic or utopian, but the alternative does not look good. Are you ready to break with scarcity and embrace abundance? Are you? Sky, the water in sky. 